You can see on the top here almost the entire tooth row. So we've got the M3, M2, M1, P4, P3, and the canine. Both of the incisors were here and uh, they came loose so we've lifted those out, but they we do have all those elements. It's a bit hard to see because the glue, but underneath we have the, the right um, M2 and M1 and that goes up underneath. So when we pull this out of the ground and clean it, we might find the other teeth in there as well. Um, you can see there's, it's a very shallow palate here, suggesting it's quite a large robustus. Down here, we've got a fair portion of the basic cranial morphology, probably the entire mastoid complex. And under here, it looks like we're starting to get some of the neurocranial vault. The right zygomatic root comes down here, and you can see it comes here and then it's broken. But that piece is just here in the ground, and it comes to just about here. It looks like a pretty clean break, so my, my hope is that that's going to go back on. And when we get this out, we should be able to get it pretty well rearticulated. Okay, and so this is occurring in a location right against the breccia. So has just sort of relatively recently decalcified out, which is why it's sort of surviving. Thankfully for us, it's in a relatively sort of very fine grained material. Um, and if we pan back, I can actually see, you can see all the large blocks of the breccia sitting around it as we go up through, up to the top of the sequence. And G for scale. Okay, welcome everybody to another episode of Bones and Stones. Uh, we've uh, had a bit of a hi hiatus for a, for a short while, so we're glad to be back. And today uh, we have a very interesting talk lined up uh, off the back of an exciting nature paper, which has just been uh, released. So here we're going to be talking to uh, Steph Baker from the PRI, Paleo Research Institute uh, at the University of Johannesburg, which uh, I'm also part of as well as a postdoctoral research fellow. So Steph, thank you very much for joining us today. So today we thought we'd bring you on to just talk a little bit about the nature paper, which uh, yourself and Jesse Martin and the rest of your collaborating uh, team uh, just published, as well as uh, other research associates from the PRI, Andy Herries, uh, Giovanni uh, Boschian and David Strait as well. But I thought maybe before we get into that, because obviously this paper is amazing and fantastic, but, you know, to, for the benefit of the viewers, um, you know, in the last year at, at, at Dream Ulam, we've had two incredible publications come out. We've had the science paper, which came out uh, earlier on in the year, uh, which we spoke to you about, and one of the other co collaborating authors as well, uh, Matt Caruana. So that paper kind of explored the contemporaneity of Australopithecus, Paranthropus, and early Homo. And, and that was based on your descriptions of DNH-134, if I'm not mistaken, and that had Homo erectus affinities. Uh, and then DNH-152, which, if I'm not mistaken as well, was a male Paranthropus robustus. Um, right. And you were able to show their kind of coexistence at around 2 million years ago. So now, off the back of that, we have a now, uh, obviously a new uh, publication later this year, and this is now the Nature paper. And you're looking at a, a cranium of specimen uh, DNH-155, if I'm not mistaken. So I think just off the back of that, one must commend the research team at Dream Merlin for putting out such incredible research and really showcasing the significance of the Southern African sites and the landscape of the cradle in answering these deep kind of questions about human evolution, the development of our species. So, but maybe just to kick things off, step to bring it in, could you maybe talk to us a little bit about Dreamulin as a site? Where is it on the landscape in the cradle? Um, where exactly do we find the fossil material at the site? Because I understand this spatially distinct locations on the site where we find the fossil material and what is our kind of chronological resolution at the moment? Brilliant, thanks so much. Uh, first, thanks guys. Um, it's really lovely uh, to, to be on again. Thank you for having me. Um, and yes, thank you. This has been a really exciting year for myself and the team. Um, so yeah, Dreamulin is a, a phenomenal site and we're, we're incredibly lucky because it is quite simple. Uh, geologically speaking, especially when you compare it to other cradle sites. The sites like Stackfontaine historically have been known to be these unbelievably complex geological mishmashes of different member systems and so on. But Dreamulin isn't like that. So we find the site almost smack bang in the middle of the cradle of humankind. Um, but also one of the things that's quite unique about it is it's very high up in elevation. 
particularly for a hominin bearing site. So it's one of the highest sites on the landscape, which means that it acted as a water insert system uh, into the, the dolomitic system. So the site in the cave itself is very small. Uh, so it's a single infill chamber, um, at least in main quarry. And so everything that came in is dated to the same age. It came in very quickly. The cave was only open for a very short period of time. And then after that, the water shifted along the landscape and we no longer had infill. So it makes it a really nice site to date. The site is however comprised of two deposits. So there's one deposit that's slightly higher up on the hill. It's about 50 meters west of the more historically well-known main quarry, which is where all the hominins come from. And that's what's called the Macondo. And it's a different geological setup in that it's not a, a, a normal cave infill system, but it's rather it's this Macondo Karen feature, which means it's these solution cavities that form around breccia and everything fills in that way. It is around about 2.6 million years old. So it is fascinating as a site and fingers crossed Australopithecine in age. So who knows, we might find some Australopiths in the near future. Thus far, however, no hominins. Um, but then the main quarry is where most of the research focus has happened for Drumulans since its discovery in 1992. Uh, it's, um, it's pretty much a, just a big hole in the ground because of line miner activity, but then also because it's so high up on the landscape, it's seen a lot of erosion. So the entire surface of the cave system is evolved, uh, completely evolved, dissolved away essentially, and then been blasted. Uh, so yeah, the site's fairly simple which means we were able to do a, a lot of different, very high resolution dates. So we did paleomagnetic dates. We did flowstone, um, or we dated the flowstone with uranium lead. And then we also did uh, electron spin resonance dating on very specific in situ teeth of both hominins and bothers. So all of those things were very well constrained and we were able to tie them all in, particularly because there is this unbelievably ludicrously small little flowstone layer that bisects you can follow it through the entire in situ deposits across the site itself. And that was so brilliant because we were able to map it and very conclusively say that there's been no disruption in the in situ breccia deposits and that everything below it is a certain age and everything above it is a certain age. And so it gave us this wonderful constrained date of 2.04 to 1.95 million. And brilliantly for us as well, all the hominins that we found, so you mentioned the Homo erectus specimen we found early in the year, Simon, uh, and now DNH 155, um, all of them date to that bracket. So they're all found in, in very high secure um, in situ deposits. So it's, we're very, very, very fortunate. No, that, that's incredible. I mean, I, I think it's also the fact that um, there's such a, a range of uh, methods and new techniques that are being used that are operating at different scales, which is really kind of what pulls all of this together and what gives you that kind of chronological resolution. So that's really important. But now let's maybe look at DNH 155. So why all the fuss about DNH 155? Because we've already spoken about DNH 152, which is already a Paranthropus robustus. So you already have Paranthropus robustus represented at the site. You also have DNH7, uh, which, if I remember correctly, is quite a well-preserved skull as well. So you have, you know, more than one kind of um, representation of the species at the site. So why all the fuss about DNH 155? Because he's so pretty. No, um, <laughs> I mean, have you seen him? So, uh, yes. Yeah. So you mentioned DNH7. Uh, so she is... And up until 155, she was the most complete Paranthropus robustus cranium ever discovered. But now 155 takes the cake. So he's, he's more complete than she was, which is really saying something. Um, but what's fascinating about it is because we have such a high level of preservation at the site, and because of, we can then tie it in with those incredibly refined dates, we can now make a case for microevolution. And that's really what the, the whole crux of this recent paper was is that it's, it's not so much that, that we have another skull, which is always exciting, but it's more to speak to, we have skulls that are so well preserved that we can now say that the differences that used to be attributed to sexual dimorphism in the species 
um, because we had DNH7 at the site and then all the other larger, more well-preserved uh, males were found at other sites like swart prawns. Um, they didn't look the same. They're both Paranthropus robustus and very clearly so with the flat face and the big teeth and all of this stuff, but they're not the same. And we can start showing that with the DNH7 population, they have a very distinct look to them. And these, these micro small morphological changes in the crania themselves that we see take place over a, a, about 200,000 years between the Dreamulin population and then the slightly later Swartkrans population. And what we've argued is that the changes have shifted all related to diet. So we can say that prior to Swartkrans and the more established robustus like characteristics in the country, we can say uh, the Dreamulin population isn't as adapted at eating hard fibrous foods. They don't have the same chewing mechanisms and the strength in the jaw. But in a very short period of time, they shifted the, the face back somewhat, the skull become bigger, and then also the sagittal crest fused because in Dreamulin, we see a bifurcated sagittal crest, which is very unusual. Um, and so all of this ties into changing and adapting to food resources, which we hypothesize is linked to the change in environment. Okay, okay, okay. Um, I see Tim had a question that he was going to ask you, and he's now just said, said that you've answered it. <laughs> and it's actually one of the questions that um, I had is, why do we see these morphological differences? If we, if we look at other um, comparable sites within the cradle, you mentioned swart crowns, for example. Um, I think you'd be talking about member one, the parenthropus specimens from there. Um, yeah, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, assuming that those are uh, chronologically, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, sim a similar period, and chrome dry B as well, which I'm not sure if it is, depending on the dating and stuff. Um, but, you know, so are you saying that it's to do with differences in diet? Because obviously, geographically, one can't argue, you know, for those changes to be caused by that, given that those sites are only a few kilometers away from each other. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, we can tell that the, the only difference between these various mm -hmm. sites, these assemblages between both Dreamil and Swart Crowns, Hanging Remnant is where the larger collection comes from. There are some poultry specimens in Lower Bank, but they're largely isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Corn Dry Beer. With those population groups, the only thing that differentiates them is temporal difference. Uh, and so we know that the Dreamil ensemble, as it stands, is the oldest of the lot. And then slightly after the Swar crimes and Chrome Dry, we're not entirely sure. Unfortunately, that's why Chrome Dry's dates are up in the air. Um, and so there's a lot of debate about surrounding the dates for Chrome Dry B. The, the team that works there currently has a much older date. And there's a lot of debate around the paleomag samples that have been taken quite um, well, a couple of decades back. So that's it, definitely we would love for them to redate it because uh, it would make a lot of sense for us. Um, but yes, yeah, so the only thing differentiating them is, is this temporal time difference. But we know that around the 2 million mark, the cradle sees a massive shift in, in the overall climate. And we're going from a very wet, very um, kind of humid type landscape to more of the, the arid, colder landscape that we see in Southern Africa today. Uh, so we know we're seeing this opening up of the landscapes and this lessening of available water resources. So the canopy is diminishing and the grasslands are expanding. And it happens fairly quickly on the landscape. And we can tell this by a bunch of different things like isotope records and so on. But um, so yeah, it makes sense that the way that the, the face has shifted, that it is shifting for diet. And the, what, the reason that they would do this is because the food resource that they originally were, were dependent on has disappeared. But then we also need to tie in that there are other hominins on the landscape. So things like Homo, for example. Homo is characteristically non-specialized. It's, it's in the exact opposite of something like Robustus, which is hyper-specialized. They can eat everything. And so they are likely out-competing Paranthropus who is being pushed into this very specific niche um, in a landscape that is changing so rapidly. So it's brilliant that they change as quickly as they do. The problem is, and, and it, it is quite successful because Paranthropus is on the landscape for nearly a million years. So they do really well alongside Homo, but you see things like Australopithecus not adapting as well. So Sediba, for example, is the latest occurring at 1.98. Uh, 
and they go extinct. Okay, awesome. No, thanks, Dan. I'm just going to hand over to Tim. He's got a question for you quickly. Yeah, thanks. It's linked to what you're talking about. So obviously you're not finding fossils all over the landscape because they're not preserving all over the landscape. And by that, I mean, you know, the whole of Southern Africa, let's say. So if you're seeing that these changes in robustness are being linked to diet, which is then linked to environment and so on, can you model across, the, across say, Southern Africa or Africa, changes in different parts of, the, parts of the continent where you don't find fossils? Could you model it in a way to start to predict what kind of uh, adaptations these robust um, individuals would have gone through in these other regions, or is that kind of prediction not possible? I'd imagine it is possible to a degree. Um, like you say, we're obviously very limited because we have this tiny little catchment zone um, in South Africa that basically represents the entire Pleistocene across Southern Africa. What we can do, however, is look at things because Paranthropus is not unique to Southern Africa. Paranthropus robustus is, but the, the genus as a whole occurs in East Africa as well. We have more of these robust Australopiths there and for a longer period of time. So we can start teasing in things like how they look in the landscapes they occur on and then how South Africa and our Paranthropus robustus looks um, and the landscapes they occur on and what frustratingly, we can't really, I wouldn't imagine, be able to pinpoint exact morphological features that kind of dictate a particular landscape, simply because this is the first time we've ever had enough resolution to do that within a single taxon. Mm -hmm. um, across the different Paranthropines, I'd imagine, yes. So if you look at something like Paranthropus boisei, which comes from um, East Africa, they are huge. They put our robusts to shame. Um, so they're absolutely massive. Their teeth are significantly larger than the specimens we have. But what's interesting, and what I will throw as a caveat to that, is the possibility that something like um, the gondolin tooth does represent a monstrously big male that is more akin to the robust Australopithecus that we have in East Africa. So he's more boise eye in size. Um, and we've never sampled anything near the size of that one tooth. So there is the possibility that there are much larger robusts in South Africa, but we just simply haven't sampled them. Um, so yeah, fingers crossed, we may be able to do that in the future, but it, it all ties into much better dating. Um, we need to have very accurate refined dates to make inferences about small scale change, uh, especially in light of, of climate. Thanks. Thanks for that, Steph. Um, could I maybe just backtrack a little bit? So could we maybe just unpack some of the primitive and the derived features of DNH 155? The reason why I say this is obviously because, um, you know, with a uh, tutoring student, for example, and when you're taking them through the different hominin craniums and stuff, we always used to talk about, um, you know, the kind of key character characteristic features of robustness, like the, the molarized premolars, uh, the reduced size of the canines, uh, the extreme uh, post-orbital constriction, the large, uh, uh, steeply rising sagittal crest, especially in the males. And we always used to talk about the sexual dimorphism between the males and females. So do we still have sex sexual dimorphism or is it, not, is it not apparent at all? So do, do we still have it? Definitely. Yeah, we still absolutely do have sexual dimorphism. Um, but certain features about what you've just mentioned there. So the, the main characteristic and the main, there's two primary differences when it comes to Paranthropus robusta sexual dimorphism. The first is that females lack the sagittal crest. So all males have the sagittal crest, uh, which is this uh, meeting of the two parietals on the skull and they push together and they create this bony crest that runs the whole length of the, the cranium. The females don't have that. Um, so DNH7 lacks a sagittal crest in all, all things. And the point second is that females are significantly smaller than the males. Uh, and this is a very common sexual dimorphism, particularly in uh, great apes. So you see much bigger males, much smaller females. So think along the lines of something like this, where you have this big male sagittal. Uh, Here we have our elite. And he has Perhaps a was digging crest, team. And these nice big flat faces. Steph whereas and the Angie. Females don't. So it's a very nice. Who are currently excavating base, out. Um, whereas something like our adult. Into, or at least male Paranthropus robustus fossil. Kind of chimpanzee the Father's Day fossil. They don't have as Ian. wide a size variability between the males. 
So that's the main thing. Other than that, however, if you look at DNH7, one of the main or the more striking differences when you look at her compared to, say, the Swakran's uh, SK48, who is a beautifully preserved male from there, the orbit shape is a very key indicator. DNH7 has these almost square-like orbits, whereas the later um, or the Swakran's males tend to have these round and more oval style, and they don't have this very kind of definitive cornering. Um, what we now see, because we add 155 to the mix, he has the square kind of orbit. So that's not something that is male to female, but rather something that's dreamulent population to swap runs. Uh, a similar thing as well, and that's been argued in the past, is the placement of the root of the zygomatic arch. So where the cheekbone flares up on the face, if you look, it starts further back in the dreamulent sample. Uh, and that's because they don't need as much of a chewing mechanism. So the further forward it hinges, the more bite force strength you generate. Uh, and so it starts further back in the face, which maybe suggests that that kind of um, morphology was sexually driven. So the choice factor there was by females and then secondarily arised as a chewing mechanism. Um, but what had been argued prior is because DNH7 has that more rear-facing uh, zygomatic root arch, is that she didn't need the bite force strength and power that the males would need, which is a silly thing in retrospect because she was clearly eating the same things. But nonetheless, um, 155 has the same with the more posteriorly based zygomatic. And so it's, it's again, it's more of this population level difference rather than a male to female um, difference. Oh, and, and 152, just to bring that specimen back, 152, who is not nearly as well preserved, but does preserve certain aspects of all of this, it's the same thing. He also has those same um, morphological features. And then if you compare the two males, uh, 152 to 155, both have the bifurcated sagittal crest. So the sagittal crest never fuses to become a single bony crest, but rather two parallel crests of the prior running next to one another. Okay, I see. I see. That's interesting. One thing I also picked up uh, just in the paper as well about the sagittal crest is the placement of the sagittal crest. So there's a kind of anterior to posterior movement. So you mentioned the, zygom the zygomatic arch as well in the roots and, you know, whether it's kind of more anterior, posterior. I imagine it's a similar thing then with the crest as well and all to do with the muscle attachments, you know, down to the mandible coming through. Exactly. So it's all to do with the mastitor. So the chewing muscle that attaches your jaw and runs up underneath your zygomatic arch for us stops here on the temporal, but with paranthropines would have run the full length of the cranium. And it's with that hard chewing mechanism where they're constantly grinding and then that muscle grows, they actually start to deform the parietal on the top of the skull. And that's what forms the sagittal crest throughout life. Uh, and so then what you could then say as a female is, oh, this guy feeds very well. He's very good at foraging. I want him to have my babies. The bigger your sagittal crest, the sexier, right? Whereas with dreamulin, they, because they don't form this fully formed sagittal crest and the sagittal crest starts much further back in the cranium, it's again an indicator that they weren't eating the hard uh, fibrous stuff that we ordinarily would have attributed to robustus. I was going to say, if only courting uh, was as simple back then, you know, just today, based on the shape of your head, I think I've got a pretty well-shaped head. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to Tim quickly. He's got a question for you, Steph. Yeah, uh, Matt, I think we should go and get mohawk shaved into our heads if, if it's all about the... <laughs> uh, I think, uh, just to show that we've got robust jaws and we're eating well. And, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, modern groups often done much different. All we've done is instead of having these internalized features to show, we've swapped it out with, you know, Ferraris and iPhones. <laughs> Look, I'm very good at foraging. Yeah. I can afford an iPhone. Yeah. Little does the good know you sold your kidney. <laughs> uh, so my actual question, it probably is a bit of a dark question, but that just chalk it up to the fact that it's not really my field. But so the skull that you found now, 155, 155, right, is... Is so incredibly complete and is part of the significance of the completeness of the skull that you can tell so much more on an individual that you would be able to tell from a broken up skull or from multiple individuals with smaller parts and so on absolutely um yeah so it's like you said that we because we have one 
very well completed uh, cranium. But then actually at Dreamulin, we're incredibly spoiled that we have two and one is male and one is female. We can start to make huge um, kind of inferences regards the, the population as a whole and across the whole cranium. Because typically what we often find in, in paleoanthropology and particularly in this late or this early period of the Pleistocene, it's isolated teeth. And there's only so much you can say with teeth. So you can say things like they have extremely thick enamel and it's very broad. And like you had mentioned, premolar become molarized, they rotate within the mouth. All of this is an adaption to chewing. But interestingly, what we can now say instead is that, you know, we know all these features in isolation. This is what they look like in one working individual. And do the hypotheses that we built up based on these individual inferences and these individual specimens, do they still hold true when linked with other features? And so that speaks then again to this chewing mechanism, because we, if we had just found his teeth, we wouldn't have been able to say microevolution, right? Yeah. Because the teeth still look like paranthropus teeth. Um, but now that we see those teeth with that flat face and the zygomatic and that sagittal crest and that small skull, we can now start saying, oh, wait a minute. Okay, whilst the teeth were adept at chewing, the face wasn't yet. And so we can we can start teasing out. And that's why finding these beautifully preserved specimens is so impressive and so important. Awesome, thanks. Well, thank, thanks, Steph. Just uh, maybe one, one final question, maybe to wrap up, um, to, to kind of throw a spanner in the works here. Um, if these differences, if these differences are enough, um, why have why is DNH one fifty five not been classified as a, a different kind of robust australopith? <laughs> so this is quite controversial. Um, yeah. So we as a team felt that yes, off the back of most publications, we probably would have had enough to to name a new species. And in fact, a lot of our reviewers suggested that we do. Uh, what we argue, however, is that we as scientists need to be true to ecology and zoology. And if we had found these specimens in modern time today on the landscape, we would have put it down to either just geographic variability or subpopulation variability, because it is abundantly clear that they are both still Paranthropus robustus. They share all of the basic features on which the species was defined. The only difference is these fine scale changes. So we argue that we can make the case that it's not necessary to name it a new species, but rather to talk about the amount of change that we see within a species or a taxon on a landscape. So they are not different species, they are temporally different or temporally um, separated taxa of the same or populations of the same species. So Dreamulin makes up what we now call a paleodeme, uh, which is a population that is temporally constrained within a linear progression. Okay. No, thanks. Thanks for explaining that, Chuck, because I, I know that was something that was discussed in the paper as well, and I knew it was controversial, so I thought I'd just uh, throw a spanner in the works there. But, uh, <laughs> but Steph, thank, you, thank you very much for uh, coming and chatting today. This has been absolutely fasc fascinating. Dreamulin is an incredible site, um, and mm -hmm. it's, it's really just great to see all of this incredible research that's uh, coming out from the site. So congratulations to yourself. Congratulations to the rest of the Dreamulin uh, research team and to all the collaborating researchers. Um, we are looking forward to what's coming out of the site again. I mean, don't, don't stop. I mean, you know, it really is fantastic, um, you no, know, what's coming out. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I know there's, I'm sure there's many things, you know, that are going to be coming out of the site. So, yeah, but thank you again. And, um, yeah, it's really been fascinating. So I hope the viewers do enjoy this as much as Tim and I did. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll be chatting to you again soon since you're becoming a regular now with all of these Dreamer Dream Millen talks. We'll be seeing you again soon, I'm sure, in the year. Brilliant. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Cool.